Thank you all so much for coming and being a part of the services here at Show Creek. We are currently going through a series in the Gospel of John. And how we're going through the John is we have decided what we would do is we'd break the Gospel down uh, into two sevens. Because that's what John does. He, he points, of course, seven being the complete number. There are seven signs that prove that Jesus is the Lord, the Christ, the Messiah to come. Uh, God in the flesh. And then also seven I am statements. Seven times that Jesus uses the very name of God. And so that is what the series we are going through. The last time we were together, we looked at the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. The miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And I titled that message, The Process. The Process. And the reason why is because you can see in that miracle what Christ can and will do through our lives if we will allow him to use us. And there's a process. It's a process that applied to that scripture, and it's a process that still happens to us today. And the first step of the process is that Jesus Christ simply wants what you got. That's what he wants. He wants what you have. When he was standing there with the disciples and the disciples saw the large multitude of crowds, um, they looked at Jesus and said, man, Jesus, you need to send these people away. There's nothing for them to eat. And Jesus was like, no, you feed them. And they're like, man, we ain't got enough. There, there's not enough money. There's none of it. Uh, they have all these excuses on why they couldn't do the very thing that Jesus had asked them to do. And the reality is we're the same way even today. We all know there's things that Jesus wants us to be doing. We all know there's things that we ought to be doing. The problem is we don't think we have what it takes to do it. We don't think we're smart enough. We're not brave enough. We're not all these things that we can think of, uh, all these excuses. And we think of Moses. I talked about that last week, about how his excuse was he couldn't speak or whatever appropriately. There's no way he could be used. The reality is when you look at Scripture is you are everything God needs to use you. You're everything. Because he's the one that built you. He's the one that made you. He's the one that created you, and he is the one that equips you. And so you need to understand that. He just wants what you have. And then when you give him what you got, he's going to bless it. And that's exactly what we see in the passage, is that he takes the, the lunchable that's given to him by the kid, and he blesses it. And that's what he does with us. He will take what you got, and let's be honest with each other. When God called you, were you the creme de la creme? Were you the greatest thing since sliced bread? Thank you for being honest. Some of you are. Some of you can see me after church and I'll explain to you how you were not the most perfect person that God ever made. <laughs> but if you understand that, he will take what you are. He will take what you have and bless it. And when he blesses it, it can be used for his glory and for his kingdom. And God will take what you have, even if it is a small lunchable. There is no way it can feed 5,000 plus people. God can do anything for him. If you will just give yourself to him. If you can just do it. He said all things are possible to those who believe. And so he says he will bless it. And then comes the part that nobody likes. He breaks us. All right? He's going to take what you got, he's going to bless you, and then he's going to break you. The truth is, every one of us has got a lot of work that needs to be done on us, all right? Every one of us has got some rusty spots that's got to be buffed out, cleaned out, maybe a little Bondo on it, something. You, you, everybody's got patches that God has got to work on, and he's got to break us, he's got to humble us. God says that he will lift up the humble, but bring down the proud. The problem is, a lot of us are way too proud. And God can't use you. He's got to break us. And the breaking is not always easy. But it is a vital part. He has to break us to be able to use us. And then lastly, we looked at the fact that the whole point is so he can send us out to satisfy others. And that's exactly what he does at the feeding of the 5,000. He takes the gift. He blesses the gift. He breaks the gift. And then he has the disciples distribute the gifts out. What is your job as a Christian? Is your job as a Christian to simply come to church on a Sunday morning, sit your royally backside down on a pew, and do nothing? That's it. That's why God put on flesh and came to this earth and died so you could do nothing. That's not how this works. 
Unfortunately, that's why churches are in the state that they're in, because most Christians have turned the church into a theater where you come and I get to entertain you. And if I entertain you enough, you may bless us by putting a dollar in that box on the back wall. That ain't church. That's not what God died for. That's not what God wrote the scriptures for. He comes into our lives and takes our royal, worthless mess, blesses it, breaks it, and uses it to be light and salt in this world. And if you're not being used as light and salt in this world, you need to go back in the process and find where you got left out. Because he will use you, just as he's using me and countless others. That's the process, and that's what we talked about last week at the feeding of the 5,000. When it comes to the next miracle, you literally do not have to go any further. You did not have to search through the scriptures. It is the next passage. All right, the next miracle is Jesus walking on the water. Jesus walking on the water. I love this miracle. I absolutely love this miracle. In fact, I have that picture, that exact picture in my office. Because in this miracle, you truly get to see who Jesus Christ is. And I want you to see that this morning. Who Jesus Christ is. Because you've got to understand, that is the whole reason for the Gospel of John. is to point us to who the true identity of Jesus and how he works in our lives. And similar to how the feeding of the 5,000, we, uh, we have four accounts of the feeding of the 5,000. We've only got three accounts of Jesus walking on water. So we're able to get a good picture of this miracle from multiple viewpoints. And we're going to go to multiple Gospels to get a true picture of how this miracle came about and what we can learn from it. So, if you ain't made your way there yet, I hope you will. John's Gospel. However, you got a copy of John's Gospel. We're in John chapter 6, literally right after the feeding of 5,000 of last week's passage. We're picking right up with Jesus walking on water in verse 15. So John 6, starting in verse 15, and we're going to go through verse 25 this morning. And I'm going to ask that if you have the ability to, to stand out of reverence for the reading of God's holy and perfect word this morning in expectation of what Christ can and will do through the hearing of his word knowing it never returns void and that faith comes by hearing and the hearing of the word of Christ. John chapter 6 starting in verse 15. So Jesus perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. Now when evening came his disciples went down to the sea and after getting into the boat, they started to cross the sea of Capernaum, or cross the sea to Capernaum. And it had already become dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. And the sea began to be stirred up because of the strong wind was blowing. And then when they had rowed about three to four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea, drawing near to the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I. Do not be afraid. And so they were willing to receive him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. And the next day, the crowd that stood on the other sides of the sea saw that there was no other small boat there except the one that Jesus had not entered uh, with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples had gone away alone. And there came other small boats from Tiberias near to the place where they were ate the bread and after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the small boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to be able to continue to go through this beautiful gospel, to look at these signs that through the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, you had the Apostle John record for us today. Father, may you grow us through the knowledge of your word, grow us through the power of your Holy Spirit, change us, mold us, and shape us into the very light and the salt that you desire and you have commanded for each and every one of us to be in this fallen and dark world. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. You may be seated. Y'all know me, I, I, there's a lot of things I like. I like music, I like a lot of stuff, but I also enjoy movies. 
Uh, movies are just something I like to do. I just sort of veg out and just watch them and sort of turn my mind off a little bit and just just enjoy a good movie. There was a movie that came out a while back. It had tons of good actors in it, lots and lots of actors. And I was like, man, this will be a good movie. Of course, when I watched the movie, it was all right. But lots of good actors. But you'll understand, since they are in a storm in our passes this morning, it reminded me of this movie. But the reason why it reminded me of this movie is because the storm in our passage has a purpose, a point. And the storm here had a reason. It sort of set up the whole movie. And the name of the movie, of course, is The Perfect Storm. And like most movies, there's always a line somewhere in the movie that has the name of the title. All right? Always the name. And here it is. It's from a meteorologist. He said this. You could be a meteorologist all your life and never see something like this. It will be a disaster of epic proportions. It will be, quote, the perfect storm. In this storm, the men are going out and they're going to catch a bunch of fish. And they go to this one place to catch it, and they do. They catch a whole bunch of fish. But the problem is the cooler on the ship breaks, and they don't have enough ice to keep the fish warm. Therefore, the fish are going to go bad. Uh, If you've never been deep sea fishing, you may not understand. Fish in that heat will go bad real fast. And so now they have a problem. They've got to get to shore with the fish because if they don't, the fish are going to go bad and they're going to lose their payday and they're, not, they're going to be starving. The problem is that there's these storms out there and the only way to get to the shore is to go through the storm. And they made a decision. The decision was this. That fish and the money that that fish is going to bring for our livelihood is more important than the risk of losing our lives. So they went into the storm. And they, of course, end up not making it out of the storm. I hate to ruin the movie for you, but if you go into this movie, you just need to know they ain't coming out that storm. (laughs) They made the choice. They gambled with their lives against the storm in hopes for a payday, but ended up losing it. Y'all, I don't have to tell you that storms are difficult. You all live in North Alabama. You know what a storm's like. Many of you have lived in the threat of a tornado multiple times. Y'all know the sound when the alarm goes off. You know it when the, uh, James Spann it takes his jacket off, you're in trouble. Um, you all understand it. I've lived through Michael, the hurricane, because we were living in Florida at the Panhandle at the time, And I've been through tornadoes before. Never had one hit my house, but I've had them hit right beside the house. I've been through storms. And I will tell you that I've never been through an actual storm that was more worse than the storms that can hit your life. There are some storms that come into your life. It can be cancer. It can be a divorce. It can be all sorts of a loss of job. It can be all kinds of situations. And those storms are far worse than the storms that actually come. Because they don't seem to leave all the time. And they don't always have a rhyme or a reason. There's nothing to it. And so that's what I want you to understand today. Just as this storm here in our passage had a purpose and a reason. There is a purpose and a reason for every storm that comes to our lives. Every storm. This past week has been a rough week for me and my family. It just has. You don't really need to know why. It's just been a rough one. And the reality is, I know in my heart that every storm that happens, happens for a purpose and a reason. Because if it don't, then why am I going through this? There's no rhyme or reason to it. And so I want you to learn this lesson because when the storms hit your life, you need to know how to react. You know how to respond. And so let's look at it through this passage and get a good glimpse on how to handle the storms of life because every storm has a purpose. And that's really what I've titled this message is a storm of purpose. So the first thing, first thing is going to be the storm. We're going to look at the storm. It's worth noting that this storm is mentioned in three separate gospels and it gives us a good glimpse of how this comes about. 
Yeah, and it should also not be a shock that storms happened on the Sea of Galilee all the time. Even Roman historians respond how awesome the storms on the Sea of Galilee are. Today, people that live around the Sea of Galilee will tell you how amazing the storms on the Sea of Galilee are. And the reason is simple. The Sea of Galilee is below sea level. And it is surrounded by hills and mountains that are well above sea level. You've got cold air coming off the top of the mountains down into the valley. It's a giant body of water that's below sea level that is extremely hot. So cold air hitting hot air on the water, what happens? Storms. And they're nasty. They happen all the time on the Sea of Galilee. And so it's not a shock for us to see that a storm has happened. What is a shock is how they respond to it. And so if you see these people who've been fishing on this sea constantly get nervous and upset, that tells you this ain't your average storm. It's a big one. And so I want you to understand that getting into it. And so we see the storm first mentioned in verse 18. The sea began to be stirred up because of a strong wind was blowing. All right, so there we have a storm. Matthew and Mark both mention the storm as well, talking about how it comes about. But what I really want you to understand, because John's gospel doesn't go into it, Mark and Matthew make it clear who actually told the disciples to get in the boat. Who are the one that did it? And that's the point I want you to understand when getting into the storm. Mark chapter 6, verse 45, it says this, Immediately, and remember, as we went through the Gospel of Mark, he loves that word immediately. All right? I laughed this week when I was writing this. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side of Bethsaida while he himself was sending the crowd away. So John tells us that Jesus is going to go up to the mountain. Mark and Matthew tell us the same thing, that he'll go to the mountain. But John left out the fact that Jesus said, you get in the boat and get out. Get out of here. I'm going to take care of this issue. And so Jesus put the disciples in the boat. He put them in the boat. Why is this important? Because most of us assume that when bad things happen in our lives, you're outside the will of God, right? That's what we assume. Oh, you woke up to a flat tire. You must have cussed or something. <laughs> That's just your karma. You're, you're, you know, we, we assume that bad things, and, and there's good reason to it, because it does say that you will reap what you sow. If you do bad things, guess what you're going to get in return? Bad things. But not every time something bad happens are you outside the will of God. You know, there are righteous people that have suffered in the Bible. They're full of it. Job was a righteous man. He didn't, he didn't do anything wrong. The whole book talks about it. And so here I want you to understand this storm that they're going into, they're going into this storm because Jesus wants them to go into this storm. There are storms that are going to come into your life that Jesus actually wants you to experience. There are some lessons in life that you have got to learn from your needs. You're not going to learn it walking and being happy. You're going to learn it in the dark, in the hard times. And I need you to see that this morning. And so there's really two reasons why he tells them to get in that boat immediately, quickly. Number one, even John mentions it. And you see it in verse six, or chapter 6, verse 4. It says this, Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. And so what happens is, is that when he does the feeding of the 5,000, the Passover's coming. And... For us, when we read the Bible, we're looking at the Passover and we think, well, what's this important? Why is it important to know the Passover's there? All right? The reason it's important to note that is because how do Americans act on the 4th of July? Anybody want to answer? We blow stuff up, right? We celebrate. It's the same for Memorial Day. We get a little more patriotic on Memorial Day. We get a little more patriotic on the 4th of July. When Passover comes, the Jewish people are excited about being Jewish. It's the day. It's, it's a huge celebration. And so now that Jesus had just fed the 5,000, they're like, this is the Messiah to come. He's the one that's going to set us free. He's the one that's going to drive the Romans out. He's the man. So they're going to set him up to be king. They're going to make him be a king. And he did not want his disciples to get caught up in this. 
So he tells them, y'all get in the boat and go. I'm going to take care of this situation. Because he knew the disciples thought Jesus was going to be an earthly king too. And so he wants to fix the situation. And so he tells them to get in the boat. But that ain't the main reason why they got to get in the boat. The main reason they got to get in the boat is the disciples are like us. They're stupid. Just being honest. We're, we're real people here. Everybody is ignorant about some things. And the disciples walked with Jesus for three years and they never really understood who Jesus was. They never really could understand what the kingdom is. And they struggled with it. And even though they had just seen Jesus take a Lunchable and break that thing up and feed 5,000 plus people with every disciple, don't miss the fact that they had 12 baskets of leftovers. That means each disciple physically had his own goodie bag with more food than what they had to begin with. You can't deny that miracle. They did that. And do you know what, that, what they missed? Who Jesus was. They missed the point. And you may be thinking, how do you know that? The Bible. Mark 6, 52. When he records it, the, Mark said it this way. That they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. And so the disciples just didn't get any good grip on who Jesus really was during the 5,000. Or during the feeding of the 5,000. So Jesus is going to put them in a boat. And he's going to put them in a storm so they can get a one-on-one -on -one lesson on exactly who he is. They're going to learn who Jesus is. And they didn't get it from the blessing. Listen to me now. They did not understand who Jesus was through the blessing. 5,000 people. Everybody's excited. Everybody is, I mean, all four gospel accounts record the miracle of the 5,000. Everybody's stoked. Everybody's excited. Everybody's happy, fat, and full. Nobody learned nothing. So let's put them in a storm, and they're going to learn something then. Unfortunately, every one of you are just like me and just like these disciples. The best way to learn is the hard way. And I would love to tell you that it's not the case, but every one of you knows the truth. You learn the hard way. And the disciples are going to have to learn the hard way who Jesus is. And unfortunately, we have to learn the hard way too. And so storms have purposes. Storms have reason. And what they needed to understand is that Jesus was no mere man. But he was God in the flesh. The reason I mention this is because as Christians, we need to know our lives are just filled with storms and with problems. And you need to know why those storms and problems are there. I had a professor that used to always tell me that you're either in a storm, coming out of a storm, or getting ready to go in a storm. But everybody's facing storms. Right now, some of you are facing addiction. Some of you are on the verge of a divorce. Some of you are about to lose your job or you already lost your job. Some of you have got five or six credit cards that are maxed out. And you don't know how you're going to handle it. Some of you are missing spouses. Some of you are missing children. Everybody faces storms. And the Bible is not silent about it. Job said this. I just talked about Job. Here's what he said. Job 14.1. Man who is born of a woman is few of days and full of trouble. Can anybody say amen? It's true. Is it not true? Everybody faces trouble. Don't, and I, and I, I have to remind myself this because I'm as guilty as the rest of you. When I get up and I'm hurting, I have to remind myself it ain't because God hates me. It's because I'm human and I'm in a fallen world. That's part of life. And that's what I need you to understand. Jesus never once said you were never going to face a storm. He never said that. He said that you would face them. I'm just going to be the one that's going to help you overcome it. That's the point I need you to understand. And to help you understand it, and to make sure you understand that all storms happen for a purpose or a reason, I'm going to give you some examples. Because here's the deal. I know that as I sit here and tell you right now, the storm that you're facing is on purpose and has a point. You're looking at me saying, you're crazy. Ain't nothing good going to come out of this. It's a horrible situation. It's bad. It's miserable. I can't handle it. 
Case in point. We went through the book of Acts several years ago here as a church. And you will see Paul faced a horrible storm as well in the book of Acts. In fact, it had a name. Um, I ain't even going to try to pronounce it. But regardless, it has a name. I had practiced saying that word, and now it's left my head, y'all. So I'm just going to move on. Acts 27, Acts 27. Paul has been in prison for years. And he said, take me to Caesar. I'm tired of standing here talking to you governors. Send me to the man. And so they're going to send Paul to Rome for trial. They're going to put him right there next to Caesar and allow him to try the apostle Paul. But on the way, if you'll remember, they hit a storm. And that storm lasted for weeks. And the ship sank, if you'll remember. And he's stranded on the island of Malta. And there they would be on the, Malta, on the island of Malta for months. And so his journey was delayed for months. Most of you get upset when your storm lasts a week, right? He's in it for months. And there while on the island of Malta, you'll remember he gets bit by a poisonous snake, just shakes that thing off, ends up healing the king's uh, servants, uh, and then they end up going into Rome. Why in the world did the Apostle Paul have to go to that storm? Why did Jesus allow the storm to take the boat, all the, the, the cargo, everything? Why did they get delayed for months on end, bit by snakes and all of it? Why did that happen? So that when Paul went into Rome, you'd have an entire boat full of people that seen Jesus work in his life. You didn't have just one man show up in Rome. You had an army show up in Rome with a testimony of who Jesus Christ is. Paul went through that storm and went through everything he did so God's name could be glorified. That's the point. But when you're going through the storm, you don't see it. Y'all, one of the most hardest situations that I've ever faced uh, was a funeral that I had to preach several years ago. And what it, the funeral that I had to preach several years ago was for my niece. Her name was Abby. Abby was born to my brother and to my sister-in-law, but she passed away at nine days old. I had never even hardly preached a funeral, and I had to preach that funeral. That's a hard funeral to preach. It's a hard thing to live through, to lose a niece like that. And you have to ask yourself, why in the world would that happen? Well, I... I can't fully know why, but I have a good thought. One of the reasons is because my father, my stepmother, my stepsister, Sears, their siblings, most of them are not believers. But they sat there that day and they heard the gospel of Jesus Christ proclaimed. Do you know how hard it is for me to share the gospel with my father? But it wasn't hard to share the gospel that day. Something else that you need to know is that that was probably the largest funeral I've ever preached in my life. The entire football team dedicated their season to her. The school talked about it. Everybody was talking about it. And the truth is, God was glorified through it. Did that make the storm easy? Absolutely not. But did God get glorified? And here's something that you have to wrestle with. You're thinking, yeah, but a life was lost. Yeah, but how many souls were saved? The truth is, is that if souls are saved, that's all that matters. But see, we've lied to ourselves and we made us think that this is all it is. It's just about this life, and that is not the case. Christ said that it's about the life to come. And not only that one, I'll give you one more example. This one's more of a famous one. Rick Burgess. Most of you know Rick Burgess from Rick and Bubba and all of that. Most of you are also aware that his two-year-old drowned. And many of you have heard his sermons. Many of you have heard his message that he gave at his own child's funeral. And he will tell you that there are countless people that are saved today because of the death of his son, because of the testimony and how they responded to it. And Rick Burgess will look at you today through tears of the loss of his son, but tell you that he would not take it back because of the countless people that are saved today. And y'all, that's the gospel. And that's what happens when you truly understand that every storm has a purpose. 
The lesson the disciples needed to learn is the same that we must be sure to know as well today. That Jesus Christ is God and he is in control. Let me say it this way. The only way I can get through storms in my life is to be assured that my Savior is in control. That's the only way I can get through. Because if not, my mind will be going nuts. I've got situations going on right now in my own home and in my own life and in my own county. We have a situation happening in our own country right now. And if you don't have assurance that God is in control, do you know what you're going to be doing? Nervous. Anxiety. You know what I'm not? Nervous or anxious. Because I know who's in control. And it don't matter what storm comes, he's in control. That's just the way it is. That's called faith. And it's something that we are required to have. He, he never said it was going to be easy, y'all. He just simply said, trust me. Trust me. He, he knew that the disciples didn't believe that they could feed 5,000 people. He just said, trust me. And they didn't get it. So now he's going to put them in a storm. And I said, I'm going to need you to trust me. To understand I'm the one in control. And so we see the storm first. I want you to see it. All right? The storm. He's the one that sent them in it. And it was on purpose. Second, I want you to see the weight. All right? So you got the storm. Now I want you to see the weight. When you read this story, you may think by just reading it, oh, man, Jesus tells them to get in the water, and they get in the boat, they're swimming, or they're, they're, they're uh, rowing on to the other side. It's difficult. Jesus rescues them. That's all you see. You don't see the weight, but I want you to see the weight. The Bible talks about it. And again, you've got to put all the, uh, all the different viewpoints together, the different gospel accounts. Verse 16 in John's gospel, it says, When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. Matthew and Mark said it this way, Mark 6, 48. Seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them, at about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. All right, that tells us something. So Jesus, in John's account, tells the disciples to go down to the sea and go. It was the evening. So in the evening time, it doesn't give them a specific, but Mark gives us a specific. He says that Jesus came walking to them on the fourth watch which if you know what the fourth watch is, it's between 3 a.m. and dawn. So sometime between 3 a.m. and the dawning of the sun, Jesus walked to them on the water. But they got in the water in the evening. So what did they do all night, y'all? They rode all night long. And what, the Sea of Galilee, y'all, is only eight miles. It's not that far. It don't take that long. So that tells us that they fought all night long. All night they strained against those oars. All night they're trying to get across all of it. And then verse 19, it says this, Then when they had rowed about three to four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea, drawing near them to the boat, and they were frightened. So that tells us how far they had gotten, three to four miles. How long's the whole sea? Eight so that tells me that they got in while the sun was still up and while the sun's about to rise the next morning, they ain't even got halfway. That's a bad day. That's a lot of fighting. Do you see how when you put all the accounts together, you get a better picture of what these disciples were going through? Not only that, that we know that Jesus is up there on the mountain as well. But I want you to see that he saw them going through it. But the weight is the point. The weight. Many of you are aware of the, uh, the Christian band named Casting Crowns. And they've been around for 20 years. If you hadn't heard of them, you need to get Spotify or something. They've been around. Casting Crowns. They have a storm. It's a famous song that they are a song uh, about a storm that's famous. Uh, it says, I will praise you in this storm. It's been rewritten by multiple different artists and redone countless times. But there's a phrase in it, and I wanted to read it to you or quote it. It says this, I was sure by now, God, you would have reached down and wiped our tears away. You stepped in and saved the day. But once again, I say amen. And it's still raining. How many times have you had a storm in your life and you're thinking, God, will you please just come and just take this away? 
And how long? But it's still raining. Sometimes storms don't seem like they're going to end. And the only way that you're going to have the courage to overcome it is to simply understand that it has a purpose and a reason. That's what I want you to understand. Y'all, I would love to be able to tell you that all of a sudden your storm is just going to end the moment you pray, but I'm telling you, it don't always happen that way. There are some times the rain's going to just keep coming. And that's where you've got to have trust and faith that at some point he is doing something. The reality is I'm a firm believer that if God has brought it to you, he's going to get you through it. All right. If he's brought you to it, he's going to get you through it. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 4. We all know this. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect, complete, and lacking in nothing. We all understand the point. We all understand that when storms come, you should actually rejoice knowing that he's doing something in your life, that he's actually changing you, that he's actually making you into something, strengthening you because of the storms that are there. Man, I heard something. This is not in my notes, and this is where I get in trouble, but I want you to listen to me because this is really, really good, and I should have put it in the notes. All right? Here it is. I was reminded of a a friend sent me something a long time ago talking about Job. And, he, and, and, and it's a, a, an African-American man talking to his teenage son. And he says, son, do you know what always amazes me is that everybody always gets upset when things are bad or happening. He said, but do you remember the story of Job that it was Satan that was walking around and Jesus looked at Satan and said, have you ever considered my servant Job? Did Satan seek out Job or did God point Job to Satan? The thing is, God pointed Job to Satan. That was God. And the man said this way, and this is what I want you to hear. The next time you're facing a trial in your life, a storm, why don't you think about it this way? That maybe somebody's having a conversation about you in heaven. That changes it for me. I'm going through this bad situation. I could be going through this bad situation because I got a father that knows I can get through it. I got a father that is wanting to use my life as a testimony. I got a father that's going to get me through this. He's got a lesson for me, just as Job had a lesson. And so that's what I need you to understand when it comes to this. Y'all, I I like what one author said a long time ago, and I'm just going to give you the quote. I don't know who said it. Uh, I think it was Spurgeon that actually said it, but I'm not sure. But here's the quote. It says, sometimes God allows you to hit rock bottom so that you will know that he is the solid rock at the bottom. He will allow you to hit rock bottom so that you know that he is the one at the bottom. There are some ways that only you can understand who truly God is. And sometimes it's through those hard lessons, those storms, that he's actually going to do it. So the storms actually become a blessing in your life. In fact, that reminds me of another song that I put into my notes. It's by Laura Story, and the title of it is simply Blessings. And here's a quote from that song. When friends betray us, When darkness seems to win, we know that pain reminds this heart that this is not our home. What if my greatest disappointments or the aching of this life is the revealing of a greater thirst this world cannot satisfy? What if trials of this life, the rain, the storms, the hardest nights are your mercies in disguise? I really believe that. I've gone through enough storms in my life now that I truly believe that everything that happens is because of Him. I truly believe my God is sovereign. And I think the reason why most of us struggle when storms hit is because we really question, is He in control? I don't question it. I believe it. That he is in control. That don't mean I understand it. That don't mean I'm not going to be upset when the storm hits. But the only way I know I can get through the storm is to know that he's in control. And so we see the storm and we see the wait. And the reality is the waiting is sometimes far worse than the storm ever is. But here's the last thing, and this is where the hope comes in. We need to see the Savior. So we see the storm. We see the wait. Now I want you to see the Savior. In verse 15, so Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and to take him by force to make him king, withdrew to the mountain by himself to pray. And so the reason I'm wanting to remind you of this when it comes to the Savior is I want you to know where the Savior's at. 
The Savior is on a mountain praying. That's where he's at. He's on a mountain praying, and the disciples are in a boat in a storm. So you got Jesus way up there on a mountain praying, and you got the disciples down here in a storm fighting for their lives. That's the point I want you to see. Verse, or Mark chapter 6, verse 48, Mark says it this way. Seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them, he came to them. Why is this important? Y'all, I don't know how far the mountain was. But I don't think it really matters how far it was. Because my Savior sees me. And this is where the comfort comes in. I'm here fighting for my life, and I'm straining at the oars. Man, if y'all ain't never, I, I go to the gym here in Priceville, and one of the machines I hate at the gym the most is that stupid rowing machine. Do you know why I hate that machine? Because it's a whole body workout. Your legs, your back, your arms, your shoulders, everything. It's a whole, I can't imagine fighting all night long at those oars. And do you know what they're thinking? Do you know what the, the disciples are thinking? I wish Jesus was here. You know, the last time they fought in a storm, where was Jesus? Asleep in the boat. And all they had to do was go wake him up. Of course, I, I say that's all they had to do. I bet they were, like I said before, they were drawing straws. Who's going to wake him up? Uh, but regardless, they're all fighting, and Jesus ain't there. And the reason I'm mentioning that is for this point. Most of you in your storm, you're thinking, where is God? Where is he? Why is he not responding? Why isn't he changing something? But what I want you to know, looking at this passage today, is that Jesus Christ does see you in your storm. He is watching every sweat drop come off your face. And when the time is right, he's coming. But he's got a lesson you've got to learn first. And he's going to let you work. But don't ever think for a second that he's left you or forsaken you. Because our Savior will never leave you, nor will He ever forsake you. And while He may not be in your boat, and you may not feel His presence right there beside you, you may not feel like He's holding your hand, and you're thinking, my God, He has left me. Know today that He has not. He is sitting there, and He is watching every little thing. And when the time is right, He's coming. That's what I want you to understand. That's what I need you to know. Because if not, you're going to sit there and be overwhelmed by the storms that come into your life. When Jesus does go to the disciples, he does so in a miraculous way. The passage, you, you, you sort of have to get a, a good glimpse of how this happens. These guys have been fighting the storm all night long. They've been rowing, as we've seen. It's now in the fourth watch of the night. And as they're sitting there fighting there, they, they see something coming on the water. And, and you have to, you got to imagine this, y'all. And I guess this is why I love this miracle so much. If you've ever been on a storm in the sea, y'all, the waves are capping. And as you're fighting, you just happen to see something in a distance. I wonder what that is. And it's getting closer. And they're, they're rowing. And, you know, eventually at some point, Peter or John's like, hey, do you, do you see that? What is that? And every now and then a wave would get low enough you could see a figure coming. And they got scared. All, all Matthew, Mark, and John, they all say the same thing. They are scared to death. Why were they scared? The same reason you'd be scared. If you're fighting all night long and in the middle of the night before dawn, I, look, how many of you are hunters? Ran, there you go. You're a hunter. When is it the darkest? Right before. I don't understand that. I'll never understand why is it so dark right before the sun pops out. I've been able to see, but now when it's almost prime time, heart's starting to pound. I know that deer's coming out here in a minute or the turkey, whatever. You, you're getting ready, and then it gets real dark. I'm saying it this way. It's dark, y'all. It's almost dawn. They're seeing something coming, and they're scared to death. It has to be a ghost. I mean, what else could be walking on the water, y'all? It has to be a ghost. And so they think there's the Spirit coming. And then that's why when you look at like Matthew or Mark, it says that it almost as if he intended to pass them by is the way it's recorded. And I personally believe, and there's a lot of different discussions on what that means. The truth is Jesus may have been passing them by. He may have been going to the other shoreline and was just like, hey, what's up? <laughs> he could have been. We don't know. But we, I believe, this is just my personal opinion, 
He came up beside them so that they could get a really good look to know who he was because they're scared to death. And Jesus would have known they were scared. And I want you to understand that. So he comes in a miraculous way. The miraculous way is simply this, that he's walking on the very waters that's giving them such a hard time. The storms that are giving you trouble, I want you to know that Jesus Christ is Lord of that storm. He can handle it. In fact, he can walk on it if he so desires. I want you to be aware of that. Verse 19, it says, Then when they had rowed about three to four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea, drawing near, and they were frightened. So they're scared. But in Matthew 14, it says this, And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. What in the world could have happened? How, what made them understand that he was the Son of God? Understand that they didn't, under, they didn't get this from the feeding of the 5,000. This was different. The storm taught them a different lesson, a lesson that God really wanted them to understand. One of the reasons they knew who he really was is because of what Jesus said. We talked about this last week during the feeding of the 5,000, how one of the reasons I do believe the Bible is true because the accounts are different. They have different viewpoints, and so they highlight and talk about different things. But what's interesting is that all three accounts give the exact same phrase. All three accounts say the same thing, that Jesus said the exact same words as he approached the boat. And here it is in verse 20. It is I. Do not be afraid. Matthew, Mark, all, they say it is I. So why, why is that important? Because when you look at that word, it is I, the word that Jesus is actually saying, I am. He says, I am. Do not be afraid. And that actually hints toward the next section that we're actually going to begin when it comes to John's gospel, the I am's. What he's saying here is he's using God's name. It's a name that was given, uh, that God gave himself there as Moses from the burning bush. It's Yahweh, I am that I am. And so what he does is he walks right up to the disciples and he says, I am. Do not be afraid. And what he wants them to understand is that as you are sitting here in this storm, I am is here and you should not be afraid. And that's what I want you to take home this afternoon as well, is that when you go home and you're still fighting the storms in your life, you need to know that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh and he is absolutely in control. He's the one that brought you to the storm. He is the one that is going to equip you and grow you in the storm. And he is going to be the one that gets you out the storm. And if y'all were Assembly of God or Pentecostals, you'd be flipping over pews right now. <laughs> but you're Baptist. In closing, I know that every one of you is going through a storm. I don't. I don't know what the storm is. I don't know how bad it is. But I know it's bad enough. But in verse 21, it says this, So they were willing to receive him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. You know, that's the miracle nobody ever talks about. As soon as Jesus stepped in that boat, where did it say that Jesus was at when he got to him? Three to four miles into an eight-mile sea. But when he stepped into the boat, where were they? That quick. It was over. My Savior has rescued me through many storms in my life. He's always been faithful and he's always gotten me through. He's never always done it on Malin's time. It's always been his time. But he's never failed to get me to shore. He's always got me to shore. The question I'm going to ask you today, are you willing to put him in the boat? Are you willing to put your trust in him? Because if not, it's going to be a long, hard storm. And I'm going to tell you as one guy that has fought many storms, you're going to get tired of rowing. And you're going to get tired of fighting. And I know a Savior whose yoke is light. He's got a light burden. 
And he can get you to the destination if you'll just simply trust him and take him in. But you've got to trust him. And knowing that when the storms come, there's a purpose behind them. And that purpose is not only going to bring you stronger and closer to him, but it's going to give him glory. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to come here today to simply look at this miracle of Jesus not only calming the storm, but walking on the storms. Father, there's so much more to this story of Peter trying to get out and all that that we could focus, but Father, that's just not where I wanted to go today. I, I just want your people to know that storms are common. That just because they're in a storm doesn't mean they're outside the will of God. In fact, they're probably in the will of God. And He's going to use that storm to bring glory to Him. He's going to use that storm to do what He does, and that's to save souls. Father, I know it's, it's hard for me to think that it may be that I have to suffer. It may be that I have to sacrifice. It may be that I have to experience some difficult times for others to see your glory. But that's exactly what your Bible teaches us. That as I go through these storms, the world is watching. Father, may you encourage the people today. May you encourage them that are going through their storms and tell them to keep fighting. And then knowing that their rescue is coming. They just got to wait. Wait on the Lord. Just as it says multiple times in the Bible. Wait on the Lord. Because we know you're sovereign and you're true. Father, speak to your people today. Encourage your people today. And if there's one here today that don't know you, that doesn't have trust in you, let them do it today. So that their storms will have a purpose and a meaning too. And it's in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.